Hi everyone, it's Professor Hall. So today we are going to talk about our first proto science fiction work and that is A True History, sometimes called A True Story by Lucian of Samosata. Um, if you did not see the summary video, make sure you go back and watch that first before watching this because I'm going to talk about some things in a little bit more depth and I just want you to have a good overview, um, understanding of it. So one of the reasons that I chose this particular proto-science fiction work is because I think that it's really interesting and it captures a few elements that are in some science fiction later and also some elements that are in fantasy later. It's also interesting to me that this is a work of satire, which I talked a little bit about in the um, in the first video. And many proto science fiction works were satirical, or they were um, like the Blazing World that we're going to talk about later. They were more philosophical works. Um, some explored the idea of a utopian society, and we don't really have. Um, science fiction, kind of the way we think of it now, Mary Shelley's book, which we'll talk about in just a little bit, because that's this week too, we're looking at excerpts of Frankenstein. Um, Mary Shelley's book, Frankenstein, is one of the first that has some of those elements of philosophy, but also um, an actual coherent plot. This kind of has a plot, I think a little bit more than a blazing world does. Um, but certainly it's a, a lot more humor than, than actual plot. It's a lot more satire than it is supposed to be a story um, in, in that sense. So, but one of the reasons that I, one of the other reasons that I chose it is because it does include elements of mythology. And I think that it's important to note that the Greeks did have scientific developments. They had a lot of developments in terms of mathematics, but they also had this these mythological stories that were an attempt to explain scientific phenomena. So for a, a short example, the question is, why does it get cold in the winter? So we have this story of Demeter, the goddess of fertility. Her daughter Persephone was uh, kidnapped into the underworld by Hades. She becomes the queen of the underworld. Um, Demeter goes into mourning and says, I'm going to kill everything um, on the planet and you'll never be able to grow any food again. So Zeus decides that Persephone spends some months with her husband, uh, Hades in the underworld and some months with her mother Demeter um, in Greece. And as a result, we have some months that are warm and sunny and some months that are cold and dismal and depressing. <laughs> um, and we have, if you study Greek mythology, you can see these patterns. Um, sometimes the stories are just fanciful, but sometimes they really are kind of a, a fictional attempt to explain natural phenomena. So what do we see around us and why is that happening? Um, I should say that there's some debate over whether or not ancient Greeks believed these myths. Um, and certainly if you have gone to Greece or seen pictures um, of, of Greece or, or of uh, in Italy that some of the Roman um, temples to their, their mythological gods are still there. Um, there. There were temples, there was possibly worship, but I think the important thing to know is that, that Greek mythology spanned quite a long time period. So you're looking at from about 1600 BC um, during the Mycenaean age, um, we first start to see some of these stories, um, both in writing, and in artwork um, and pieces of pottery, things like that. And this kind of lasted until about 400 AD, um, the Emperor Julian's reign. By that point, Greek mythology was kind of thought more of as Hellenism, which is like a celebration of Greek culture. So it's not really clear <laughs> during that long time span, um, right? whether they, um, I, I, I would, 
I would guess to say that at some point there were people who believed these myths or at least some of them, but they weren't necessarily always stories to take at uh, it as truth. And this is kind of important because Lucian is a satirist, so he's poking fun possibly at these beliefs, but really more at writers and um, rhetoricians, people who would kind of travel around and, and, and have philosophical debates, right? And also people who are claiming to be historians, who are mixing together Greek history with Greek mythology. And he seems to be kind of ridiculing that type of writing very specifically. That if you're going to tell the history, tell the history. If you're going to have mythology, have mythology. But don't pretend that there are these historical events that, you know, and then the gods intervened. That's one of the things that he's making fun of. Which kind of at least says that by the, the time he's writing, which is around one. 10 to 180 is when he lived, um, AD. Um, by the time that he's writing, we at least have some people who think that these stories are um, fun, but ridiculous and clearly not true. So the other, so, so that's kind of how he's taking these mythological things where we try to explain phenomena and, and kind of poking fun at them. We also have though in this story, a little bit of uh, what what is a big part of science fiction later, and that's speculation. So the speculation of what if? What if we came to the edge of the world? What would that look like? Now, there were um, other stories that kind of explore this, but they really are purely mythological. Um, and and, and would be now put in the realm of fantasy, which very often borrows from those mythological creatures and figures, right? That's a big part of fantasy writing today. Um, but he kind of looks at what if we come to the edge of the world? What if our ship is born aloft on the wind? What if it goes into space? What would space look like? What might be out there? Um, those are some questions that come up in this story. And he's not attempting, obviously, to, to, to look at it um, from a, if you if you watch the genre video, this is not hard sci-fi, right? There's not actual explanations for how the ship is born aloft um, or how it comes into space. But certainly this is uh, one of, if not the first space battle. Sorry about that. It was my alarm telling me to get up to record this. Um, but I got I got there ahead of time and forgot I had that. Um, so this is kind of like the first space battle. And I really like that he's taking these mythological figures. Um, and Didmion, who in Greek myth is the lover of the, the moon goddess. And he is possibly a shepherd or possibly a king pretending to be a shepherd um, in various retellings of this. Um, Zeus, the the god who rules um, over the heavens and the earth, <laughs> um, he rules over Olympus and the earth. Um, he puts Endymion into an eternal sleep um, after the, the shepherd or king has asked for asked to be put into such a state. Um, Phaethon is the Greek god of the sun. And so we don't have, again, just strict interpretations of these characters. He's really taken them and elaborated on them and almost kind of used the names to come up with characters of his own. So that Endymion is the ruler of the moon. He has people that he's taking care of. Um, they have the need to expand, and when they try to colonize, the way that um, the the way that some countries in Europe were already kind of spreading out, um, when they try to colonize, they come up against the god of the sun, who doesn't want them there, and then they commence this battle. So. 
the the idea here that you have a battle in outer space that you're using mythology almost as a jumping off point um that you are um, not just within these institutions, but kind of looking at them critically, which science fiction very often does. These are all part of this first part of the story. Then after the battle, we get into the um, some questions about life on the moon and what that actually looks like. Um, I should mention too, I forgot that during the battle, it is supposed to be quite funny that you have men on flying acorns, you have men who are using um, vegetables as like spears and shields. So it's supposed to be this very exaggerated, ridiculous, um, kind of humorous battle. To me, if you picture it in your head kind of like a cartoon, it, it works. If you think of it like a cartoon for kids, for, for modern readers, that, that's how I would suggest looking at it. Um, but at any rate, after that battle, then we get into questions about the social structures of the, the moon and the way that the people are living there. Um, and I think that, again, as a proto-science fiction work, we see this trend a lot in science fiction literature as well. We're going to be talking about it a lot more in the, in the other books to come, that technology and speculation is part of it, um, the actual science. The other part of it, though, as, as people who are writers and who are um, studied in the humanities, which even Lucian would have been being a rhetorician, that you have this question of, um, can we do this in science? And if we can, should we? And what would the results of that be? But also, um, let's examine our social structures and can we make advancements in how we interact with one another? What is the best way to set up a society? That's basically the question that is being asked here. I want you to think about, um, and there's no right answer to this, but he is criticizing, obviously, um, religion. Uh, you can see that in the first part um, at the edge of the world when they come upon these this place that Bacchus, the god of wine, or Dionysius, his other name, has been. And there are these women who are beautiful, but they are also women on top and grapevines on the bottom, but they have the parts necessary um, for sexual relations. They try to draw the men in, and uh, and that comes to some dire consequences for the men who, who are drawn in. We also have later on some criticism of religion. Um, Lucian was originally a Syrian who then um, became a Greek. So I think that he would have had some knowledge of the Jewish religion. He did definitely, he was known uh, for a different piece of writing where he talks about groups of early Christians and some of the things that are happening with them and criticizes them kind of to, to I think, a, a little bit more gentle a degree than he's making fun of the mythology here. So there is some criticizing of religion. That's what satirists do. They hold things up and they kind of criticize or ridicule them or at least question them. And later on in the story, I mentioned Judaism. Um, he he has the the ship after it descends from space, comes back to Earth, and it's taken into a whale, which would not be unlike the story of Jonah and the whale um, that can be found in the Bible and in, um, in Jewish texts. So there is some criticism of religion. That particular portion, by the way, is not part of the excerpt that I gave you guys. The excerpt was a little bit long, and I wanted to cover a couple works this week. But at any rate... Um, you do have a link if you want to read the whole thing. So criticism of religion. And then we also have this look at the way that the society is structured on the moon, which he comes to start sort of looking at this idea of the pederast system. Some Greeks um, had 
an idea of sexuality that was based a little bit more on the penetrative act rather than someone's given gender. And I say some Greeks because it really isn't clear the extent to which this was practiced. And also, as I mentioned before, you are talking about a culture over a period of several thousand years. So it would be like comparing even us today in 2021 to people in 1940, right? We have quite different morals and social structures than we did um, you know, 1920, I'll say, 100 years ago, things were quite different um, in terms of social structures, technological advancements, and things like that. So over several thousand years, you can kind of understand how it's difficult to tell when this was occurring, when it was acceptable, when it was possibly not acceptable, um, and that sort of thing. But at any rate, the idea would be that a an older man would enter into a relationship with a younger man that this was not just a sexual relationship, but really a um, kind of mentoring relationship, and that there would be, in some cases at least, sex between the younger man and the older man, um, where the younger man would be the one on the receiving end. I want to put it kind of as delicately as I can without getting too graphic um, for, other, for other listeners. So, um, this is basically what's happening on the moon. You have men who are a little bit older who are in the husband role and the younger man is in the wife role. And then when the younger man become older, then they take on younger men. It's a society of only men and they have um, childbirth in a couple of different ways, either uh, that a child comes from a man's uh, leg or that they bury um, a part of their nether regions and that a child is birthed in that way. So again, a little bit of satire there. So I would say one of the things to look for, is he um, criticizing this type of system? Is he holding it up for ridicule and saying that it's ridiculous? Or is he kind of saying, well, this is a social system, and what if? What if this were the only social system? How would that work? What would that look like? Um, or is he kind of endorsing that type of system? I think it's not entirely clear, especially for modern readers. So um, I think that taking a look at that is something that we will definitely do in the discussion boards and see what you kind of, what your takes are on it. Um, so, so just to wrap everything up, things I would like you to look for. Number one, um, the way that we are using mythology as kind of a jumping off point and this interesting mixture of fantasy um, with a little bit of science fiction. Number two, um, the way that this book or this work has precursors to later science fiction works. The, the space odyssey adventure um, and that kind of thing. Number three, the way that the author is examining both possibilities of what could happen in space um, and also social possibilities of what different societies could look like and how they could be structured. And number four, the way that he is mocking things, um, certainly, because that is really a large part of this work. So how is he making fun? There's some notes from me and some notes from the translator um, about different historians and different writers that he's poking fun at. How is he making fun of those historians? How is he making fun of religion? How is he making fun, possibly, of some of these social structures? And um, I hope that you enjoy it. I probably talked longer here than it will take you to read it. It, but I really do hope that you enjoy this work for the, the fanciful adventure that it is. So I can't wait to see your thoughts on it. Thanks, everybody.